Hey, Mike from Prep Pros here, and for those of you who don't already know me, I've been a full-time SAT tutor for nine years. I've scored perfectly on the SAT myself. I've published what I think is by far the best digital SAT math book out there. And although this is gonna be the first time the digital SAT is being offered in the US, it's been offered internationally for the past year, and I've been working with students, so I have a way better idea than most exactly what you're gonna see on test day. So in this video, we're gonna cover 10 things you're definitely gonna see on your digital SAT. I'm gonna teach you some really important tips and tricks along the way to help you quickly improve your SAT score. Now, the first concept you're gonna see on your digital SAT are punctuation questions testing your ability to understand whether information is necessary or unnecessary for the sentence. If it's unnecessary, we have to put commas around it. If it's necessary, we don't wanna put commas. Now there's many different rules around this, but one of the most commonly tested ones is the names rule. So we're gonna use these two examples to make sure you understand it. Now, when you're trying to determine if you wanna put commas around a name or not around a name, you always wanna look at the descriptive element before the name. Now, if that descriptive element could refer to more than one person, you don't wanna put commas around the name or names, but if the descriptive element is specific to one person, the CEO of Tesla, that could only refer to one person, we can put commas around Elon Musk, but there's many famous American entrepreneurs, so we cannot put commas on the first example. So as we look at this example, the descriptive element before the name is researchers, well, that could refer to thousands or hundreds of thousands of different people, and that will tell me I don't wanna put commas around the name. Now, the next thing you're gonna see are scale factor questions. Now, your scale factor is always gonna be how many times greater a corresponding radius, side length, diameter is of shapes. So here we see circle A has radius of 7n and circle B has radius of 119n, where n is a positive constant. Well, our scale factor is gonna be equal to 119n over 7n. So that's gonna give us that our scale factor is 17. Now that scale factor table that I'm popping on the screen here, this is gonna give us really simple rules. Once we know our scale factor, the times greater the area is of one shape than another is simply gonna be your scale factor squared. So it's gonna be 17 squared, and that's gonna let us get 289. If we're dealing with volume, it's your scale factor cubed. The SAT has been putting a lot of these questions on, and if you don't know your scale factor rules, they're really hard to figure out. Now, the next thing you're gonna see on the SAT, especially in that second more difficult module, are advanced quadratics questions. And one of the most common concepts they love to test on are discriminant rules. So here we see in the given equation, B is a positive integer. The equation has no real solution. What is the greatest possible value of B? Anytime you are asked about the number or type of solutions of a quadratic, it's a discriminant question in some way. So here, as you can see in that table that I popped up on the screen, if we wanna have no solutions, b squared minus 4ac must be less than zero. So we can see our a value is negative one, our b value is b, and our c value is negative 676. So we're now just gonna plug those in. We'll get b squared minus four times negative one times negative 676 has to be less than zero. Well, this is gonna give us that b squared minus 2704 has to be less than zero. We'll add that over. That will give us that b squared is less than 2,704. Now we'll take the square root of it since it's a positive integer. That tells us that b has to be less than 52. If we're saying, well, what is the greatest possible value of b and it's a positive integer, that's gonna tell us that it has to be 51 is our correct answer. Now the next thing you're gonna see on your test are lines questions. And this is actually one of the best Desmos hacks we can use to make your life a lot easier. So all we're simply gonna do is we're gonna type in table, and then we're gonna enter in two points on that line. So we're gonna just use the points negative 11 and 21, and we're gonna use the point negative 10 and 18. Now if we want Desmos to solve for the equation for the line for us, which is gonna let us solve for that x-intercept, we simply need to do y1 so it knows to pull from the table, and then you'll hit this little tilde button, which is most likely on the top left portion of your keyboard. And then you're gonna do m x1 plus b. Now that's gonna give you your entire equation of the line and it's even gonna graph it for you. So now if we wanna find that x-intercept, we just have to click on that and we can see that negative four is gonna give us our correct answer. Now, the next thing you're gonna see on the SAT are questions where they're gonna introduce variables that are gonna block you from simply using Desmos to graph and solve them. And here we see in the system of equations above, k and m are constants. The system has a solution of six comma y. What is the value of k? Well, we can plug in six to help us solve for k where x is, but we need to clear out these my's. So the easiest way we can do this 
So we can take our whole top expression and we can multiply it by negative 3 quarters. Now as we do that, that's going to leave us with negative 6kx minus 6my equals positive 6. And then our bottom expression is going to say the same, 3kx plus 6my is equal to negative 24. But now we can add these two expressions together, we can cancel out those my's, and now we're left with negative 3kx is equal to negative 18. And now we know we have a solution at 6 as our x value, so we can plug that in for x. So that's going to give us negative 18k is equal to negative 18, and that will give us that k is equal to 1. Now if you want practice with a handful more questions very similar to this, and to check out the entire system of equations chapter for my math book and math course for free, you can do that in the free trial to my ultimate SAT course. There's over 40 additional system of equations problems, and you're going to learn some of the easiest Desmos hacks to help you solve questions that aren't quite this challenging. Now the next thing we're going to see on the test are in terms of questions. Now anytime you see questions like this where it says the given equation relates the positive numbers a, b, and c, which equation correctly expresses c in terms of a and b, well as you can see the answer choices we're just trying to isolate for C. Now, oftentimes fractions give students a lot of trouble with these, so the best thing you can do if you're dealing with fractions and in terms of questions is to go ahead and cross multiply. So we're going to end up, as we do that, 4 times 3C is going to give us 12C. When we cross multiply our 9A and our 16B, that's going to give us 144AB. Well, now if we just want to solve for C, we just need to divide both sides by 12 and that will give us our correct answer of B. One of the next things you're going to see on the SAT are semicolon lists, and this is something that always feels really strange and challenging for students, but if you have a complex list, which is a list where you have commas being used in the list for a reason besides listing, we need to use semicolons to break up the items in the list. Now, a dead giveaway to these questions is if you ever see a semicolon with an and or an or already in the sentence, that's going to tell you you need to look for semicolons. So as we read through this, the Arctic Alpine Botanic Garden in Norway and the Jardim Botanico of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil are two of many botanical gardens around the world dedicated to growing diverse plant species, both native and non-native. That's giving us extra information about the species. Now the second item in the list, that was our first item, was growing diverse plant species, both native and non-native. The second item is fostering scientific research, and the third item is educating the public about plant conservation. So because we have this comma here, which is not being used to break up items in the list, but is being used for extra information, that's why we need to use the semicolons between the other items in the list, and that's what you need to look out for on test day. Up next is exponential growth and decay. Now we're going to cover the basics here for some easy and medium difficulty questions like this, but especially if you're getting the second harder module, you can expect some far more difficult exponential growth and decay questions. Now the basics we want to understand is this is giving us our y-intercept, and when we're interpreting these, like we are in this question, that always gives us our starting or our initial amount. This is going to be our rate of growth and decay. So since it's less than 1, this is going to show decay. If it's greater than 1, it would show growth. This would show us a 35% decrease period over period because you do 1 minus 0.35 to equal 0.65. So now let's go through and interpret this. The given function f models the number of coupons a company sent to their customers at the end of each year, where t represents the number of years since the end of 1998, and 0 is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to 5. That just means we're only modeling this out five years after the end of 1998. If y equals f of t is graphed in the ty plane, which of the following is the best interpretation of the y-intercept of the graph? So as we just talked about, the 8,000 is our y-intercept, so we can knock both of these off quite easily. We always want to think about that, that's our initial or starting amount. So that has to be the amount we had at the end of 1998, and that's going to show us why d is our correct answer here. Now, the next thing you're going to see on your SAT are notes questions, and there's six different varieties of these, but one variety that gives a lot of students trouble and shows up more in the second difficult module is questions like this. The student wants to present the study to an audience already familiar with environmental DNA. So what we want to do is present the study, but since it's an audience that's already familiar with environmental DNA, we don't want to be giving background information on environmental DNA because the audience is familiar with it. So as we look through our notes here, what we can see is the top three notes are giving information about environmental DNA, so we don't want to include those, but the bottom two are giving information on the study, and that's how we can see that A is correct here. It's not giving information about eDNA, and it's presenting the study. This gives information about eDNA, this gives information about eDNA, 
and same issue here, that's how we can eliminate all of those answer choices and that's how we can identify A as our correct answer. Now, the last thing that you will definitely see on your SAT is what I call advanced sentence structure questions. These are going to require that you understand how to identify independent clauses, dependent clauses, and phrases. And if you get that second harder reading and writing module, you may see a few of these questions. So here we see he was instrumental in organizing the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Well, that's going to give us an independent clause. As a result of his leadership, this will give us like a little introductory phrase. And now we have the Spanish colonizers were expelled from the region for a time. That's another independent clause. Now, since we have two independent clauses, we have two full sentences. So the only answer choice which is properly going to join those two is the comma plus our fanboys. Now, if you aren't familiar with independent clauses, dependent clauses, and phrases, and any of the basic rules around we can how we can join those together, please check out the free trial of my Ultimate SAT course. You're going to learn all of that and get a lot of practice which can help give you a really good foundational base to have a shot at answering these more advanced questions correctly. Now, I really hope this video has helped you out. Outside of the 10 topics that we've covered in this video, there's many other topics that consistently show up on every single digital SAT. So if you're looking for a crash course that's gonna help you learn the most commonly tested concepts and focus on the places where you can most quickly improve your score and teach you some of the most essential Desmos hacks as well, go ahead and check that out in the link below.